thank you for making the effort to be with us today. We're, we're thrilled to be presenting this exhibition and I have had the joy, and I'm not overstating it one bit, of getting to know Rajni and her work better over the past months as we've prepared for this exhibition. And I just look forward to sharing over the next hour or so with you, you know, some of the experiences I've had being able to listen to her stories and, uh, and, and learn about her work. So um, I will move us into our first slide, which is I think, um, the title of the exhibition is Rajni Pereira Futures, but one of the thoughts that I had about the show, oh yes, book sales, book sales, book sales. <laughs> it's a really a beauty. Faria Royson so and good. Britt Ray they are guest uh, writers in this book. They're both internationally acclaimed authors with strong connections to Toronto, but huge Rajni fans from way back, and they jumped at the chance to contribute to this book. So yeah. their perspectives are yeah, Incredible. mutual mutual fans. Yeah, We're all mutual fans, and they like knocked it out the park. Like they wrote so beautifully. They really Both did well. Both essays are just yeah. like heart rending. Heart, like, heart very rich. like joyful and like hopeful and like emotional. Man, they are. I mean, they're just also just doing their job. <laughs> just doing their job. <laughs> just being great writers. That's yeah. true. It's so true. But one of the other, you know, titles for this show. I mean, obviously, Rajni for our futures because she's making us think about future worlds future possibilities and potentialities for, for humankind and for the, the planet as a whole. But also, you know, the other the, the title for the show that I had in my mind was Rajni Pura by hand or made by hand or handmade. Because in this, oh. in this world of art that we're in, the hand, you can see that texture is a thing for Rajni. Yep, just a little. <laughs> Just a little I bit. I kind of like texture a little. Sen sensuality, texture, so that visual surprise, color. You know, it's actually kind of wonderful to have you in the gallery adjacent to Norval Morisot. I mean, if, yeah. you're, if your retina I mean, remains it's intact an, it's an honor. after both galleries, you know, it's, yeah. you know it's, it's, it's wonderful. But there is this devotion to the handmade and those traditions, I think, of the part of the world that that you come from. And you've yes. talked to me a little bit, Rajni, about being in art school at OCAD and mm -hmm. looking at work that, you know, where that was not the case. Could you just take us into that for a quick minute? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, starting starting at OCAD around 2000 and 2004, fall mm -hmm. of 2004, I think. And uh, going in, still living in Scarborough, you know, we lived at like Eglinton and Bellamy. So, and they were starting to sort of, it's so funny, when I started school, they're starting to cut buses. It's a poor part of Scarborough, so they yeah. don't, obviously, they don't say anything to anybody. It they just, just cut bus routes. Oh, it's out of service. There's no more service here. So my commute back and forth to school was grueling, starting to become like really taking like four hours out of my day. I was <sighs> like spending a very long time commuting downtown and coming back home and starting to be like, oh, I should really move downtown to like be in the scene or mm -hmm. whatever, like just be closer to the, this this career that I'm trying to get into now and start really thinking about. But starting at school and uh, coming from this this part of the world where, uh, first of all, and me and Jen were talking about this in the car up, is like where art and humans, you know, are living together throughout their lives in different yeah. capacities. You're wearing it, somebody made it, and you're wearing it. Mm -hmm. Somebody, you know, painted it, and it's in your, you know, it's, you, you, you know, it's in your home, it's in people's homes. There's regular interaction with it. The idea of the museum or cultural institution is not really, you know, not yeah. really there yet. I mean, we, Sri Lanka has colonized three times, so we have three different legacies of building cultural institutions, but all of the crap that goes with that exclusivity yeah. and you know the privilege of attending those, understanding what's in them. But yeah, starting at OCAD and really noticing that, you know, it was quite a, a conceptually centered mm -hmm. art making that was that high baby that was <laughs> at the center that was that was being paid a lot more attention to yeah. and even even not being forced on, I don't want to say forced on the student population, but definitely encouraged, encouraged. to have more, like less of a, hand, less of the hand in there and more sort of intellectually driven art making mm -hmm. practices. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny too, I was starting to understand that craft and art were mm -hmm. separated yeah. in this way that was so weird and strange to me. 
um, where you know things that are and like craft making practices such as weaving, like very important and yes. storied, long legacy making practices were being like kind of shoved away into this craft yeah. category, which and is denigrated like, really. And it's also like mm -hmm. the, it costs less because it's craft, mm -hmm. you know. And there was this undervaluing yeah. of the hand in the work, and I was like, I don't like this. <laughs> I'm gonna go extra hard and make every single thing by hand. So, and I did, and I still do and that today did. where I can't, I can barely tolerate making something completely, not, yeah. not making something completely. Yeah, like farming out bits of it to people. Is I like, can't, I yeah. can't, I can barely do that. Yeah. Like, I'm just, I kind of feel, it's not guilt, but it's just like, uh, you know, well, you're I cheating like yourself. You, it's almost like you're cheating yourself with some of the bit, connection yeah, because, to the work. Yeah, but I have immense joy in making, and yeah. you can see that in the works, and I hope that you can. It's baby oh, rash. <laughs> it's baby. You've um, been doing this a long time, too. Yeah, yeah. well, from my past <laughs> life as well, but, um, but <laughs> I love that kiddo. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, really noticing the, to that divide and, and insisting on being involved in making yeah. everything that I make with my hands. And I think that making it, uh, the artist making work with their own hands charges, charges it with magical power. Like it has yeah. a charge. And I think the clothes that we wear and the objects we use today we're missing out on that now yes. because they're made in factories. They're Industrial. made by yeah. I can feel that. Like, I feel it. I remember know. talking to the wonderful artist Janet Morton, who uh, makes a lot of things with weaving, and she talked about being on a residency. She's Canadian, and she talked about being on a residency in Iceland. Mm -hmm. And she went with some, you know, sweaters that, because, of course, it's very cold. She went with a, a bunch of different sweaters, two or three sweaters that she had that were, you know, factory-made sweaters. And the people there were horrified. They were like, does nobody love you? Like, why are you wearing this? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like, right. it's like, it's like wearing, you know, like, you know, garbage bags on your feet or something. As far as they're concerned, it's like yeah. sad yeah. if your people haven't made you a sweater, yeah. you know? Sure. And so, yeah, I yeah. mean, I think the thing about the handmade... And again, you know, I just couldn't resist putting this up because, you know, it just shows that you took such pleasure in making yeah, from a very, very early age. But, you know, um, uh, that, that it, it's the investment of time and intentionality mm -hmm. into materials over mm -hmm. long periods of time. And I think that's one of the things people will see when they look at your work is, you know, it's almost a devotional aspect yes. to what you're doing. So very here's... Nice. here's um, Baby Raj and her sister Anisha mm -hmm. um, on a trip back to Sri Lanka. You can you tell a little bit just quickly the story of your how your family came from Sri Lanka to Toronto? Yeah. So so um, hmm, right. So we were only able to get a visa because my mom worked in the news. Mm -hmm. She's so a broadcast we're, journalist. She yeah. was a broadcaster. And, you know, we're like a middle, lower class family living in sort of this dusty part of Colombo called Dehiwala. And um, it's so funny. I went back and visited the home where we grew up. Yeah. And it's so small. I didn't know how small yeah. it was, right? Because um, I left when I was nine. And, you know, you lose that thing. Right. Over time, time distorts the, it. Yeah, and the scale of where. And also, I was small. So things look bigger, but it's so little. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, we live behind a, a quite a big sort of slum. So from the main road, Gaul, there's a huge slum. Yeah. And then our house was on just a lane that's kind of behind it. Behind I it. remember in the backyard, you could see banana trees of like an empty lot. And then my friends, all my friends' houses, which are on the other side, because I was friends with, that's my friends. And, uh, you know, that's a slum that kind of grew. And, you know, over the time that we're living here, uh, it became a little more dangerous over time. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, my parents ran into some trouble. Um, yes. And we had to actually uproot and leave. So so we got the visa because my mom, uh, my mom's face was known. It was known, very difficult yeah. to get a visa to leave the country, as it still is. It's very hard. Exactly, particularly very, right very now. Hard. You need to know people. You need to have money. You need to hand things off under the table. It's very difficult. But, um, yeah, we were able to leave and then... Uh, we flew to, um, my parents told me that uh, we were going to Disneyland, and mm. I've still never been to Disneyland. I'm good. I don't really want to go. My daughter has been, so that's really good. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm like, good for you. I've never been to Disneyland. 
I, I think we um, need to do a road trip, Raj. They had to say, yeah, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I would like to see something. I would go and see Universal Studios, yeah. like the Jurassic Park ride and stuff like that, but not Disney. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what they said, so we wouldn't make a fuss. And uh, yeah, we flew into um, New York State. Lived in Buffalo. Lived in motels in mm-hmm. Buffalo, New York, for about a year, under a year. Mm-hmm. And then we finally crossed the border into, into Canada. Canada. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's the whole story. And we yeah. went straight to the North York area, kind of the Jane and Fit, like Driftwood Avenue area, Sentinel mm-hmm. Road, uh, living there for uh, until I was a teenager and then moving to Scarborough mm-hmm. and then I moved downtown. So that's the whole story of Regney's geography, geographical mm-hmm. With movement. With little, a little stint in Australia in there too. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I was, my sister was born in Australia. Yeah. So there was a lot of Sri Lankans in Australia. Um, so very much a sort of, Diasporic, you know, there's experience. a huge Sri Lankan diasporic community in yeah, Australia. Yeah, and um, you've told me when we were working on the book that, you know, I was sort of thinking that maybe it would be disorienting or you know to be dropped into Jane Finch after this experience. But you were like, actually, everyone there was new to Canada. Yes, yeah, it it's just immigrant. Like, I mean, as a, you know, there's very few immigrants who will come to a new country and not go into. Yes, you'll be. You can get caught in a white neighborhood not being white. Right. It's fine, um, but most cases you're gonna go to around close to where your family mm-hmm. is, a place that you've heard about. You can get your groceries that you need. You know, you'll do mm-hmm. a little research and wind up in a neighborhood with several other cultures that you're kind of sh- you know starting to share space and share mm-hmm. ideas mm-hmm. and and grow the grow culture, grow yeah. cultures together. But um, but yeah. I love I love this picture. Yeah. So the first work of yours that I remember seeing was this body of work, the Yogini series. Yeah. And we just have uh, one slide from the series here today, but you know, I think you've told me that this was a reaction to ways in which ideas of the global south were being commodified in yeah. the culture that bodies, you saw. Bodies bodies from bodies from the global yeah. south and the way that the global north believes that they do look and should look and like you know this was a series so mm-hmm. there's a story and you know this is one of the first bodies of work I was able to put out after I had my daughter mm-hmm. um, and I got a grant from my friend Zanette uh, who runs Q Sketch and she let, you know she basically started my whole career mm-hmm. after school by giving me like a micro grant like make work again and I had been thinking about the sale of the colored body um the sale of the colored body uh, in the context of um, sort of holistic practices yeah. in yeah. North America, yoga especially, mm-hmm. and and sort of Ayurvedic products and, and those kinds of things and the way that, you know, our bodies were being sort of uh, put inside like the masks in the exhibition, put inside this glass box to show and to be looked at in a certain way, very extractive kind of way. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a series where I, I take back lots of power into our bodies. Yeah. And I kind of transmute that, that neutralizing or, or that degrading sort of gaze into a display of, of power and a display of strong bodies and uh, and um, feminine energy as well, which I thought so here we was go also on being the... stripped away from us yes. as our bodies were being. You can't. That's one of the first things that kind of drains out is female energy. So here we got some. Oh hey, <laughs> <laughs> this is another really early. Yeah, female pe- animal energy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also gathering. You know, the, that gathering back in, gathering. In. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of energy. Uh, going out and coming in, mm-hmm. I think, in the work that mm-hmm. I'm interested to paint about. And working with photography that you were applying paint on top of. These yeah, these yeah. early works are not not included in this exhibition. They are included in the book, just because many, many of them are locked up in Sri Lanka. They're in sh- where, sold in Sri Lanka. They can't, they can't get them out, so yeah. we have to enjoy them, you know, yeah, in I mean, this way. I, yeah, I have, like, good documentation of them, but, yeah, getting mm-hmm. our hands on those would have been, it's not worth it. Here's and another you did one. A beautiful of the... exhibition without them, Sarah. You don't need. Oh, I know. That but no, I always is... want more. She did amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so the the yeah. the 
Maharajas and Maharanis, this is, this is the series that uh, comes before the work that is in the show yeah, here. Yeah, it's the series that comes, so I saw this, I saw, so I went to the Rom one day when my daughter was very small um, in the winter time, and Deepali Diwan, who's a senior curator at the Rom, she's been building this archive of painted photographs. Mm -hmm. By the way, I've never seen this before, never seen anything like this before. And uh, walking through the ROM, and it's just in this beautiful room, kind of like the room that you constructed in the center of yeah. the exhibition. There's a room like that in the middle of, I think, like the uh, East Asian pavilion of the ROM. And then I'm walking in, I'm just like struck by this, this way of making, it's kind of this like proto Photoshop, like world building practice mm -hmm. that was happening there, where they're, you know, uh, around the turn of the century where photographers were coming down from north northern England northern Europe mm -hmm. into you know other country exotic nations and other far off lands taking photos of sort of aristocrats and bureaucrats the people at that time this is cutting edge photography is cutting edge technology not everybody can even close to afford it so as a result it's you know there's a lot of kings and queens that are being photographed mm -hmm. and re these prints kind of reproduced at big scales for a show of like spectacle of power types of things uh, uh, being uh, uh, making these images, but of course they're black and white. Yeah. And uh, whoever has traveled or comes from Southeast Asia, you know that our world is not even close to black and white. Our colors are very, very vivid. Uh, I think it's also the angle of the sun. It makes colors very, very bright. It makes colors sing. So we need to add color to this. So what's happening is now court painters and sort of sign painters and artisanal craft painters are being employed and brought in to add color to these pieces. But what ends up happening, of course, is that there's sort of these, it becomes dreamlike mm -hmm. and it becomes exaggerated and it it starts to it starts to build, you can see myths building inside these photographs of people. Um, and yes, the spectacle of power is something that I noticed was like really, really being pushed mm -hmm. in these first sort of painted photographs. There's lots of gold, glittering gold. They're adding lots of like sort of health and vigor to, in a lot of cases, quite inbred, you know, upper caste people, trying to make them look more vigorous and more, look more rich and ornate and opulent. So that just kind of like, I was thinking about that and turning it around in my mind after seeing those photographs. And I was like, you know, this is something that I, you know, I know a lot of really wonderful people. Let me, let me try to do this. Uh, try this medium this is a me this is not it's not it's a medium of, of expression and it's a world building practice to to sort of engage these people that you know and say something about them mm -hmm. or tell another story using them as a subject so these were women in your life that you yeah these are people that i know doing really cool work this is zara siddiqui she's a pretty well-known um, artist and photographer um, between scarborough and regent park i believe mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. i don't know where she's living now She's also stunning and gorgeous, so there's that. Hmm. So this was another big moment for me in terms of following your work was seeing this piece at York. Now this piece was <coughs> really big. Yeah, huge. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was in a show that was organized by Philip Monk and Emily Changer, I think, wasn't that? What was the name of that show? Migrating the Margins. Migrating the Margins. They won the exhibition of the year at the It was OAG a great, great show. It was just that show. But the whole back of the gallery, I don't, you won't want to brag, but was full on Raj. Yeah. And, and this piece was in, in a kind of back room of its own. You walked in and this thing was towering above you. Yeah. And you were explaining to me when we were making the book about the kind of diasporic subtext of this piece with yeah. the with the with the racks can Dry you can racks. you just yeah, yeah tell us about that yeah I mean yeah one day I was staying at a friend's house and she had a drying rack out you know and I look at it and as I've looked at so many drying racks before because you know uh coming coming here and living in North York early days is just like you know there's no washer and dryer, we didn't have enough change for laundromat or sometimes, you know, you just gotta wash the clothes in the bathtub, whatever. And we have many drying racks, so there's like, you know, the clothes are drying, different various stages of drying throughout the house. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, looking at this drying rack and realizing, oh, it, that looks like a torso. Kind of mm -hmm. looks like a torso. And I'm a big fan of um, Robotech and Gundam Wing, like I'm a huge anime fan. So I watched a show called Robotech growing up 
and uh, <laughs> started to think about turning turning a turning drying racks into uh, a, into a mecha droid. Um, and specifically, this is the VH Team One, uh, who is Dana Sterling's. It's Dana Sterling's um, battle droid of choice in <laughs> uh, in the Robotech series. And um, yeah, I, I learned to arc weld. Uh, making this, and then I put together uh, the VHT1 using three IKEA Frost drying racks, um, in, and I had to weld it inside the gallery. They had to turn off the fire extinguisher, the fire alarm, uh, arc welding it turns, so I don't know anything about welding as I'm learning to arc weld, and it stinks. Mm -hmm. And the sparks are flying like <laughs> six, ten feet high, and Philip's in there like, oh my god. <laughs> And it's smelly and it's smoky. I'm like, I'm so sorry, guys. Yeah. So they had Gotta to turn off it. the. Yeah, <laughs> he was like, he's like, yeah, we're gonna have to turn off the fire alarm. So they did do that, and I was able to complete this. And then I found, I was looking, I was thinking of clothing it somehow. Yeah. So I found in the Value Village on uh, Lansdowne at Lansdowne and Bloor these banquet hall curtains. Um, which, you know, any brown people who are here, you know what a bank banquet hall curtain is. You've spent some time in some banquet halls here and there. And I was like, this is great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that VHD1 kind of look like an angel. It you does. Know? And like yeah. drape it, and then we lit it behind. You can't see it on this with like purple, hazy light. Yes. And then I painted a moon in the background because um, I wanted to pull it closer to Robotech, you know, back to that because uh, that's a beautiful show with hand-painted backdrops of space, you know, stunning. And that's some of the first, by the way, some of the first artwork I've, I s ever saw was in animation, Japanese animation. Stunning, mm -hmm. beautiful artwork, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's so the story it was, of it was a huge declaration, though, of the kind of the force of your creativity. Yeah, I mean, piece, I'd though. never, I, they trusted me. You don't get curators like you and them very often with no. lots of trust. Like, yeah, of course, go ahead, because Emily and Philip approached me on the basis of my painted work. Yeah, you and have to just time, sort of stand back and yeah, let it happen. Yeah, I was just like, yeah. uh, can I weld a robot? <laughs> and they were like, yes. I know you like my yes, paintings. Yes, you can. I was like, really? <laughs> That's amazing. So I did. I welded it. And it's not easy to arc weld. And I should have definitely started with MIG or TIG welding. Now I know that now at this stage. But yeah. that's fine. I mean, I learned yeah. to weld in the yeah. hardest welding method possible. Now you know. And so... <laughs> God only knows what's going to come of that yeah, in the long yeah, term. Yeah, yeah, I mean, So what they had probably not. known was works more like this that were starting to yeah, happen around yeah, the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Painted works of, you know, female bodies, uh, you know, very much like power mongering, slightly yeah. violent works, uh, and paintings from around the time that I was doing. They saw my work at uh, some artist-run gallery, and then they called me up and I had no idea who they were, by the yes. way, because I'm outside. I, I kind of operate outside of art world. I don't really know that too, too much of what's going on, especially at that time. And then I start to learn about their legacy of what they've been doing. Yeah. And Philip Monk has just won the Governor General's Award. I was like, I, I don't get starstruck. So I always approach people very sort of candidly and, you yeah. know, very much on a person, human level. And then, but as I started working with them, and finding out who they were and what they've done, <laughs> starting to get nervous, like yeah, retroactively, yeah. like, oh, hey, Philip, how's it going? Oh, it worked out so well. <laughs> it worked out so well. <laughs> but yeah, it works like these, like painted works. Um, this is the dancer series. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. These are what, you know, I find what's so interesting about the dancer series is that they're both, um, like, they're full of energy, but there's also a slight bit of, like, they're pointy and sharp. Like, there's, yeah, they're slightly menacing. And I, this, you know, is the, this embellishment around her hips? I, my, my mind kind of makes it into a bullet thing. Mm. You know, like I find it yeah, kind yeah, of vacillates yeah. between being decorative yeah. and being slightly menacing. Yeah, is that yes. is, sure? Yeah. Sure. So the the dancer series and a lot, and you know, if you can go back to Palapa just yeah. quickly. Yeah. Whoops, that one next one. On. Whoops. It's going too far there. Yeah. There. Yeah. So so these are these are some works where I'm. You know, I was thinking about starting to think about dance because yeah. the other sh work in the sh AGYU show, Migrating the Margins, is huge dancing Dancers. spirits. Yeah. So starting to look at dance is this, and especially sort of like choreographic stills from like non, non white owned and run dance companies. So like just like to blow open what is, what are the movements of dance, acceptable expressions of dance, Alvin Ailey, mm -hmm. uh, dance company, just like looking at stills from these different dance productions, and then 
at that time I'm starting to think about talking talking about um, talking about the colored body, talking about change and mutation. Mm -hmm. This is when mutation is actually starting to come into my work in a funny way. Yeah. Um, and try and showing that like using the aesthetics of science fiction, like these types of like sharp protrusions and colors and fades, imposing that on the body and kind of extruding it and protruding them to talk about a very dynamic and changing body, mm -hmm. um, which I feel in myself, in my own body. Yes. Living like in, in, this, in this body that I live in. So, so yeah, dancer series. And yeah, this is the type of works that they, they saw when they're approaching me. <laughs> so, um, And then I think, you know, by the time, I mean, after York, then you got into the Traveler series, and this, this work, I remember, was bought at the art fair by RBC. And entered this is there. a commissioned work for oh, RBC. It? Oh, okay. I had thought it came to me. Them. Yeah, ah, they yes. came to me through Devon. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so this is a very special traveler. This is the, my first sort of like larger sort of institutional acquisition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they were really, that curatorial team is fantastic. Like mm -hmm. very cool kids and nice to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this is a- Tell us about her mutations. Yeah. Something's yeah, so, going on with her eyes. Yeah, so I'll start with like traveler series. Yeah. Uh, I, I developed traveler in a, I, the first traveler was painted in a solo exhibition at you know at that time it was probably just Patel Gallery yes. at Dundas and um, Broadview, and um, and I was like, okay, you know I want to bring mutation into the work in a very specific way, but for me mutation is occurring through you know diasporic populations are replete with mutation on many many levels, so we've got you know, emerging physiological mutation, which is evolutionarily speaking, I really like, by the way, the difference between evolution and mutation and the factors that affect both of those things and the time scales of both of those things. But we have de slowly developing physiological mutation as people who are from one latitude and longitude are now, you know, moving, um, breeding together with and evolving throughout their own lives in another completely different mm -hmm. biome and different part of the world yeah. with different mineral contents in the soil and different types of water and air. And then we've got mutation on sociological um, level as well, the way that people are interacting with one another, the way that different cultures are coming together and making new sort of proto cultures or uh, double cultures together with their own, like there's contradictions, it's difficulty, you know, growing pains as these things happen religiously and spiritually mutation yeah. where, you know, we'll have very sort of a religious family going to another place where there's an atheistic ideology and then there's the their offspring trying to reconcile those th things and coming up with maybe a third spirituality there in the center mm -hmm. and or able to see both, you know, and their life is enriched in this way. So thinking about mutation and thinking about especially sort of climate refugee type of immigrants and immigrants like myself who just have had to uproot because of, first of all, a dream of one place and the threat of the place they're coming from. So in adversity, moving around. And, um, and science and like the sort of main narratives of science fiction and protagonists of science fiction who are people who are moving from one place which is very difficult and hostile and moving through difficult and hostile environments and being victorious, mm -hmm. being resilient, being very beautiful and, uh, and innovative and so on and so forth, kind of traversing this difficult place but coming out on the other end victoriously, mm -hmm. right? And opulently and beautifully, like luxuriously as well. So I was like, you know, I really love science fiction growing up quite a bit, so much so that I was starting to notice in my teens that it's uh, science fiction's white. Yeah. And I was just kind of like, I don't like this. I want to when I was like when I grow up, I'm going to put, you know, folks of color into science fiction and use it as a way to talk about, you know, identity in a way in in a certain kind of way. So Traveler is my attempt at mirroring the science fiction 
the narrative of in within science fiction of off-worlding mm -hmm. and uh, sort of um, sort of surviving yeah. um, with the experience of the immigrant, which is very much the same in many many ways. So I wanted to make two like um, two mirrors that show show these two stories together. Um, it's really sort of the opposite of this, uh, you know, American imperialist, you know, agenda of a lot of you know, Hollywood produced science yeah, fiction, which is about America it's saves an the day, issue. It's or we're, we're going to blow propaganda. up the incoming comet, or we're going to off world and everyone's going to be white. Yeah, I really, <laughs> I really hope that Matt Damon starts <laughs> looking at his scripts a little more closely with a critical eye. Like, yeah. I really got it. I got. I want to see that guy do a little bit better in what he's starring in or like deferring these roles to somebody else but it's like yeah. it's uh yeah i mean that i didn't really notice again i didn't notice this i didn't have like really critical thinking on right. science fiction until i'm sort of in school or mm -hmm. you know later on in life but uh yeah also trying to remedy this thing you know trying to remedy this situation and i in the work as a world building kind of effort i try to make or paint or sculpt technologies with ideas that are compassionate yeah. and uh, equanimous mm -hmm. and egalitarian rather than, you know, really, I mean, there's some weapons that I've made, but they're yes. altruistic, like the one that you'll Look. see on the back enclave is Ring yeah. for Truth, and it's a magical weapon that you can use to pull the truth out of people who are lying. Um, it Let can also, see if I can... they're very, they're sharpened to like a knife point, like you can kill someone with those things, you know? There like, they are. Yeah, yeah, they're very <laughs> sharp and very solid brass sort of weapons, but that's the one I think I've done. The other ones, you know, they, they turn, it's like, it's like a, it looks like a beautiful sort of uh, a pipe, and you know, you suck in polluted air, and yeah. then your body's replenished with like a whole bunch of oxygen for a little while, you know? So I try to think about making, mm -hmm. you know, gentle technology mm -hmm. and and technology with an idea of love in some way. Yeah, rather well, I think than you really the other way. Feel that in the work. I'm just going to step back yeah. into the ancestors. I think you feel that with the work. This incredible feeling of generosity too. And there's like a warmth and generosity yes. to the work. Yes. To the Traveler series in particular. Yep. Yep. Ancestors. If you just go back to ancestors, mm -hmm. I just want to say that that in my, so these are proto-travelers. Uh, you can see that they're not too severely mutated and they're kind of like these beginning off where they're the first off-worlders kind of thing situation. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an effort at building time, building time into the world yeah. building practice. So like having a reference point of travelers in the most recent uh, time and then this is something back and then you know time. step further back and then we have humans the way that they are today so there's this confusion about the deep past and the future and the present all kind of flowing yeah i really other. like to uh i really like to smash time together and pull mm. it apart in my practice yeah because right? this work uh ancestor two here really has this feeling of like historic samurai costumery or you know i know some of your work draws on medieval armor mm. yes and you know all sri lankan yeah, I also really like sort of North miniatures. Indian, yeah, North Indian, Mongolian dress, like mm -hmm. these are things, but the, you know, any, you know, it's, it's costume, it's not costume, I mean, it's, uh, right. it's armor and attire from any culture that's having, and it's made with lots of love mm -hmm. and care um, and delicate work, but it's made to stand up to the elements and protect the people who are wearing them. So that's sort of what I would, that's my criteria for a successful traveler ensemble is, <laughs> yes. is that, you know, it's function and form. And well, they're protects, living together really nicely. Protects on several levels is sort of protects what Protects on several yeah. levels. And as I referred to the technology before, there's like, yeah, there's protection of your own spirit. Mm -hmm. There's protection of your, you know, your love. There's protection of you know your family, or there's you know there's things that are made to to uh, um, give yourself some longevity, but it's not at the expense. Like I'm trying to make little technologies that are not extractive, yeah. you know, and they're they're sustainable. Even at the even the youth youth workshops that I'm developing here with Anna, um, one of them is centered around 
magical technology. So sit down, address an issue that we're having trouble resolving in our world that's related to climate. There are many. There's very not and very much not enough urgent thinking about this. But sit down, address the issue, and come up with something. Draw it. And just think about mm -hmm. that. Oh, there's those lucky kids. I mean, but there's also there's also been such a divide for so long between yeah. the arts and STEM or STEAM, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. The arts and STEM have been kept apart for too long. As a result, STEM, especially in North America and Europe, is suffering. We're not advancing I mean, I think, as far as we could be. Yeah, and I think that's you one of the things I was... We can't go on, so I just wanted to do that. I want to try to do more and more of these types of workshops. And to be honest, a lot of my exhibitions now as they travel I'm trying to do stem or steam talks as opposed to an artist talk right interesting I mean I think and one of the things we were saying at the reception for you the other night was that you know it's it's creativity that is actually in, in some ways something that got us into this mess the human ingenuity with technology and so on but it's going to be human creativity that's going to get out of get us out of the mess we're in yeah. and it's like Art is just one manifestation of creativity. It's like we need creativity in science, in economics, yeah. in social organization, yeah. all these different realms of human endeavor. It yeah. will be creativity that saves us. And I kind of feel yeah. like... My thing is always like bring the artists in. There are only yeah. two, like two or three residencies worldwide of engaging artists in STEM or STEAM, like thoroughly. NASA has one, SETI. It's so cool you that have SETI, to do NASA. the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, they have an artist residency to develop, you know, civilization <laughs> finding technology. And I'm just like, okay, so what? There's only, what, two in North America? What are you guys doing? Bring yeah. artists in. Yeah. You know, we make tech too, but you make it like STEM would make, sorry, STEM would make it feasible. That's my thing. Okay, so I'm, I'm like freaking together. out. That sounds so exciting. I didn't know about that NASA. SETI, yeah, NASA's, SETI? NASA's, yeah, SETI for me is all, oh, I, I really want to <laughs> okay. do it. Well, we'll work I'm, on that. Yeah, I'm booked for several years, like it's a bit of a production schedule for me, but as soon as it frees up, I think we I'll better go, get you I'm in there. Going, Absolutely. Going <laughs> Absolutely. So, so these works, Flood and um, Storm, which is the one after one afterwards, are one, two works that seem to me very explicitly about the heavy weather that we're in, about... Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they're sort of apocalyptic works and they're using this type of paper that you've become very, very fond of. Can you just talk about these two works a little bit, the flood and the storm? Yeah, sure. Um, these were made for the inaugural show at Patel Brown mm -hmm. on Wade. And uh, this is, so this is not, this paper is marbled paper that I purchased in the store. So it's a mulberry stock paper and it's been sort of marbled with oil paints in Thailand. And you know, starting to look at and work with different surfaces that can imply mm -hmm. the elements. Um, of course, as some people may know, and you know for sure, I started marbling on my own in a nine foot by 11 foot massive vat full of methyl cellulose solution. Started marbling my own paper, some of which is visible in the commission for the mm -hmm. McMichael that's at the back of the exhibition, the three back archers. from here, mm -hmm. the three archers. So, so re I'm really enjoying working with marbled paper to imply a surface which is shifting, which is in some cases you can't really touch it. In this case of storm, it's, this is air and it's wind, right? So it's moving, some of it's moving in front of the body. In the case of flood, the person is submerged inside it. So really liking to work with these kind of pre-prepared or self-prepared sort of like uh, shift, a surface that's implying a shifting and transient slightly volatile uh, surface. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I started kind of painting these little things and then moving into works like this that are it, being Im sort of explicit about, mm -hmm. about, um, about a inhospitable climate. Yeah. Um, and uh, my work is moving more and more into this, um, speaking on this theme outright and mm -hmm. kind of more urgently uh, I, I'm not really seeing galleries or museums putting artists in there who are talking about climate change where it's actually this a central and very unnerving um, and shocking uh, urgent threat that we're living in that we're not being responsible enough about. Um, and we're trying to go on and get in our cars every single day and go to work and come home and 
Yeah, the, our, mm -hmm. our world is dying. Mm -hmm. It's dying quickly, right? A lot more quickly than anyone wants to talk about. Wants to talk about so it. I just yeah. want to have used my work now to have this beacon of, hey, 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 hey you know? But I think the thing something. that's so powerful about this image, which we will be, you know, using in marketing, and I think it will later on in the in the flow of the winter will be appearing on some bus shelters and stuff downtown where, I mean, this is getting to work in Toronto in the middle of the winter. If, you, if this palette was blue, this is, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is what, you know, this, but, but we are facing heavy weather on so many fronts with, you know, the climate change, but also what's happening in Ukraine and Europe. Yes. Uh, the, climate refugees from the global south and so on. It yes. just, it feels very, very overwhelming, yes. this moment, this historical moment we're in. But this, this to me is an image that's full of a hopefulness. It's like yeah, yeah, this person yeah, I is do soldiering insist. through it. Yeah, and I do insist on that Going part of to it. a new place. I mean, at the end of, at the end of the traveler story is, uh, is victory, right? Mm -hmm. it's vic and I insist on that, mm -hmm. that. I insist on being hopeful, optimistic, um, you know, it just it just puts your brain in a better place to solve problems well. This is it. Solve them well. So so I kind of tend to always lean in, in that direction. Well, we're very thrilled that Rajni is going to be making a, a, wall, a large wall mural for us at the McMichael that will be up. Be up. We're going to start working on it in the spring. And yeah, in the springtime. It'll be the whole, that whole entire hallway that you guys walked up to get in here. Yeah. I'm going to just do a, a like a mutated uh, long landscape, but Remember, yeah, like kind of like registering it to the horizon line. Yeah. It's visible through. So the when you're walking window. along, it'll look like you gear shift from our forest here in Ontario yeah, you can to still, a kind of a lush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that'll be really cool because mm. it shows that it shows reality and it shows a possibility at the same time as, yes. you're, as you're walking up through that hallway. So that'll be really awesome. Actually, I'm looking forward. It to just occurs that. to me right now that. Um, one of the unintended ironies of that might be the fact that with global warming, that the whole vegetation in this part of Canada might be changing radically over the of next course, 30 or 40 of years. Of course it is. Yeah, so, the trees are very stressed out. And I mean, yeah. we're going to have to start planting. And they're changing. We're going to have to start planting probably GMO trees and mm -hmm. shrubs that can take it now because or, we still need them to make oxygen for us. What right. are we going to do? Yeah. We got to figure figure things out. Well, you're going to help I, us I always out. remember my mom one day, she told me, you just wait. You know, one day Canada is going to be a vac vacation destination. And after... <laughs> Hey, and not just I for mean, skiing. Hey, like we barely had a fall. Like it was yeah. like summer and then it turned into winter. Did you guys see that? Like that's real. Like what yeah. my mom said is kind of right. Yeah. You know, it's like being war it's definitely being a lot warmer for our, for a lot longer during yeah. our year. The first thing we'll see suffer is probably crops. Yeah. Food will be something that I mean, you know, that's the best way to get a population to pay attention, civilization yes. to pay attention. It's like, hey, you guys can't eat. Yeah, the thing you want in the store is not going to be there, so we have to pay attention yeah. to these things in a big way. So urgently. we're also, you know, while Rashni is doing that, just for you know, public service announcement. Well, while Rashni is is while that is in the house, we're also doing a show this summer um, on uh, called Uses of Enchantment, which will be about um, climate change, species loss, habitat loss, and how Canadian artists of the past twenty five years have been dealing with that. So other artists who are Partners in crime of yours, like you know Sherry Boyle, Bill Burns, hey. Hava Val Manumi, uh, uh, Carrie Allison from the Maritimes, uh, Winnie Trong, who's an artist that you yes. know from uh, Patel Brown Gallery. But it will be a kind of a a big think about nature now versus nature ideas of nature a hundred years ago. We'll also have a Tom Thompson retrospective upstairs here at the same time. So it's like a time machine mm. of you know how he how people experience nature. Settlers experienced nature in Canada 100 years ago versus today. Now, yeah. You know, how people are looking at our experience of nature. And Sandra Meggs, who many of you will know from her recent show at the Art Gallery of Ontario a few years ago, is making a, a kind of a climate apocalypse forest out of suspended uh, banners that will be hanging where your show is now. This is the wow. next show after you is Sandra. And it will be, people will walk from the Tom Thompson sketches into these gigantic you know, flaming trees and, and so on made by Sandra in the next room. So it will be, I think, will make people look in a different way at the like yeah. legacies of Canadian art history and, and how That's things awesome. have changed and whose voices we need to be listening to. Right. Um, so, you that know, even if we're in a climate apocalypse, we need to bring the love. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. this is a beautiful piece. And there's there's um, a couple of these amazing masks in yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started the pollution where... 
um, for the first traveler show, like mm -hmm. doing an exhibition. At the time, it was Patel Division, um, and uh, and I decided to, this is before. This is one year. It's literally the fall before COVID. I remember we did that talk COVID, there together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did all this pollution wear and gas masks and functional functional pollution wear, which is like you know heavily embellished and mm -hmm. hand worked and beaded and. Yeah, they look like sort of luxurious bra cups that went yeah, over your yeah, face. Yeah, you know, most of them are completely functional. You yeah. can screw the canister on. You can wear it and go, you know, um, all different types of dust and particulates. Mat and I think there's like an N95, an N6, um, three different types of military gas mask. But they're all pretty much functional. You mm -hmm. can take, wear it and go. Yeah. In this collection, we took in a wonderful piece by Ruth Cuthand which was a COVID mask that was all beaded and embellished. And yes. been making works like that as well. So it's like art is mutating to meet the times. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to that functional place that I was talking yeah. about before, you know. That's Imagine a, a future. That's a cool loop that's mm -hmm. happened now. Mm -hmm. So the plain bend. Yeah, it's a, that's a light work. Um, I started so working, so sorry, go ahead. Moving, just moving into abstraction, I think, is... Is that's a place very to start, I mean, this you is know? your, this is, it's so cool. That's your, I love that you see it in that way. For me, it's just like exploration, further exploration of aesthetics of science fiction to mm -hmm. get it, to co-opt it into, I try to just wrangle that to tell my story, right? But um, starting to make light works. Uh, I was working in a studio with um, this amazing light maker uh, named, uh, oh my God, what's her last name? It's Kate, I can't remember her last name now, but it's Concord <laughs> Custom Lighting and fantastic light maker. And uh, you know, we were kind of like looking, we were sharing the studio building, looking into each other's studios, you know, now and then mm -hmm. like, oh, that's cool, that's cool. And then I was like, hey, Kate, do you wanna, do you wanna make, uh, start making some lights? You know, I started by making some lights just for my home, yeah. my own home, you know, cool things I would never be able to buy, like brass, like very simple. And then started coming up with these other ideas, like, hey, would you want to do this? So we made a couple of lights together. Um, in this case, this is a simpler one, um, plain bend, which is just sort of like, and they're all kind of exploring, you know, the arc of the planet, the sun coming up on the other side. They all reference these kind of stills and moments from science fiction and print and film and uh, uh, literature as well, science fiction literature. but. Um, but wanting to just keep exploring that and those feelings that science fiction gives me in this functional object. Mm -hmm. And there are many sketches in that room as well that mm -hmm. some of them have led to lights yeah. and some of them, it's impossible. I mean, I remember showing some of these sketches to Kate and her being like, yeah, that's literally physically impossible. We can't do that. And I'm can't like, oh, done. shucks, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we come can on. figure it out. I'm very yeah. hopeful in this way, but sometimes it's just not possible. Um, yeah. But I see yeah. this, I mean, I, you know, we've talked about it a bit, but I see this very much as a reference to um, the female body. Like, to me, it's like a pelvis yeah. holding this, you know, glowing energy. Yeah, I mean, in what ways does it, does the, the landscape or the, like, spa or in what ways do the spacecape not reference reproductive mm -hmm. technology within our own bodies, reproductive systems and and our own bodily systems. Like I also have this great effort throughout my work of mirroring the small and the huge and vice mm -hmm. versa, right? Because, mm -hmm. and at that, and that same sort of practice is at the heart of most of most successful tantric painting, which mm -hmm. is energetic painting. Yeah. So, so it's just like, it's holy math. Holy it's math. that holy math. Well, I think, I, I think that this, this whole little, this is why we had to create a little room inside the museum because I felt like inside this gallery because I felt like these works needed to have a very quiet so special cool space of their own you know I would never think of these oh things. it looks so this good um, it's awesome there's the magic pearl mm -hmm. yeah that one actually did become a light but I covered the outside in fur so it's like a furry butt and thighs and on the inside <laughs> on the inside is the light so you can kind of like, at the right angle, it does still look like a horizon with the sun rising mm. at the right angle, yeah. And curtain call. 
Very which and cool. here we have this like wonderful lavish investment of the beadwork and the, yeah. the the fabric textures and the applique and the yeah, marbling. I'm not, I'm not a textile artist, so like huge learning curve. So mm -hmm. the fact that you think so highly of this, it seems you like you are a textile artist. Actually. Sweat, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing about an artist like is that the, you can like call the arc yourself welding. whatever you want. Yeah, <laughs> call yourself whatever you want. But yeah. Um, but yeah, we're looking into textile now because. Because when I started marbling, you know, marbling paper at this large scale, it, paper is pretty fragile. Like it doesn't really, it's kind of like dicey to handle and ship and reship and reinstall. Mm -hmm. So now I was just kind of like, and also the going for the scale that I want, you know, setup costs are very, I'm quite a frugal, budgeted artist. I raise a small child, you know, as a single parent. I can't be spending exorbitant amounts of money on all sorts of crazy things. It's all kind of quite reined in and mm -hmm. controlled. So, so setup costs for very large paper were so high that I resorted to textile. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you know what, you know, really kind of enjoying working with it and like mm -hmm. getting into now the legacy and the story and the history of textile work and textile artists and looking at how the way that different things have been done, coming up with my own way to do things. But yeah, this was, this is paper, this is paper. Fabric that's been marbled in a huge vat and a sort of like had to come up with a different way of and uh, te a te different technique and different materials of marbling at that scale to still keep it feasible within mm -hmm. budget. So, so coming up with sort of like a methyl cellulose solution uh, to fill a vat that that's that's that big, and then with acrylic inks um, and good consultation with with uh, you know Heather from Articulations who's here today on the types of inks and acrylic stuff that I could be using to make these patterns that normally they'd be done with oils inside a seaweed gel, which goes mm -hmm. bad for instance, like you can't, I couldn't do that. So I had to come up with a different way to do this. And then yeah, marbling textile in these really big scales and it's really joyful and very fun process. I hope that most of you get to do it. And uh, pulling these patterns and then putting mm -hmm. them together into, into painted and stone and stitched and beaded works. Um, yeah. And this is for an exhibition called In the Realm of Lightning with uh, the artist Nep Sidhu. So we had a duo show at Patel Brown Gallery and these works were made for that, that show. So tell me about this, this walking figure. Yeah, so body as vessel is something that I've needed to come back to again and again and again. And one, one of the reasons I keep coming back to it is that I'm a mother and mm -hmm. I have this very base physiological sort of um, fixation on the idea of a body in containment, not just for, uh, you know, the immense power and magic of being able to make a life inside your body, but, um, but uh, the body is a storage, as a, as a, I mean, it's incredible that we're living inside these electrical bags of meat <laughs> is yes, crazy is, to me, <laughs> but but as the body is a, a energy storage yeah. device. And, you know, I also really love, you know, and that's, so, it's a bit of a tangent, <laughs> but, but I also really love jewelry, for instance, that keeps objects inside, inside. of it. In the same way, in uh, Tamil Nadu, in the south of India, they have these um, containers for linga, and uh, linga is like the, it's, you know, it's a small phallus, and it implies reproductive energy, male energy, but it's the fe the feminine component of it is this architectural silver, beautiful container that you wear around your neck. And it's the same feeling that I have for the human body mm -hmm. and energetic containment. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, and then actually in the show, I did do a piece about that, those very, the, those jewelry pieces. Yes. I did make a work about that. Um, but this is the kind of thing I'm, that's the kind of feeling I'm trying to make the work about in this work in particular. And you can see it's surrounded by sort of these planet celestial bodies as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then the body is completely black, like a void, like a vacuum. So, so it's, it's glorious. It, thank you. I like the space. <laughs> I like the space. It was the first work that I made for the show and it gave me lots of confidence to to keep going. Oh God. It could have just, gone the other way yeah, yeah. where you make it and you hate it. And I'm just like, damn it. You know, no, well, now what? A, what? It was a breakthrough. Now? Yeah. It was a breakthrough. And you've made, uh, this is one of our last slides, um, but uh, you've made a number of spaceships, kite, kite spaceships. Oh yeah. Um, 
Big and fan of spacecraft. Yes, and so here's one back in your yep. so this uh, is country the, of Sri Lanka. Yeah, this is the NC-1701, so it's the Starship Enterprise that I'd made. Uh, I, in Sh Sri Lanka has a, a beautiful, and you know, there are many countries, Buddhist countries, especially in Southeast Asia, that share a lantern making uh, and kite making culture. You know, there's parts of Sri, Sri Lanka is, first of all, it's paradise. Um, but there are very sort of windy plains, you know, when you get close to the hills. So we have amazing kite making culture and then, uh, of course, lanterns as well for our sort of harvest festival uh, that happens around April, May. And uh, we build these, you know, they're very, they're these like geodesic, very simple sort of um, polygonal, like uh, it's a whole bunch of sort of octagons that you piece together to form mm -hmm. something that's so, so beautiful. But it's very simple math, you know, and I work for this, I worked with a kite, so we had to find a kite maker. This is for Colombo Scope. I made this for Colombo Scope, which is a beautiful art festival in Sri Lanka. And, you know, I had to find, find a kite maker, lantern maker, so we find them in the market, me and my friend Fieri, find them in the market close by to the Colombo Public Library. And you know, I start kind of talking to him. First of all, I, he's never seen the Starship Enterprise before, and he's just like, "What is that? A plane?" I'm like, "Kind <laughs> of, but it goes in space." And he's like, "Oh, okay, okay, cool. we can do that." Yeah, but you know, starting to work with him and show him my ideas and schematics of how we can come up with this sort of geometrically, but he doesn't work like that. He works with sort of young bamboo strips, which you bend apart so there are arcs in his work and you know simple ways of putting things together that result in this again the word holy math is coming up here yes. but these sacred geometry sort of um sort of assemblies of math that result in mostly the shapes kind of the shape of lotuses like flowers floral shapes so he kind of like works in this really intuitive way and he put something together. So there are parts of this that like do not, they resemble the hull of the NC-171, but you know, not really. Like when it was just frames, I had to let go at some point mm -hmm. of the way he was making it. I was just like, you know what, dude, just go. Just <laughs> make your it. Thing. Yeah. I don't really understand what you're doing, but you know, I'll work with you and give it, cause he would come and ask questions like this. Do you want more pedals? And so as a result, the thrusters, have an entire flower in the front of them. And yes. the Starship Enterprise does not have flowers <laughs> in the front of it. So, so yeah, it was a really beautiful, oh, yeah, it looks uh, like kind of pure experience working with this dude who was honestly kind of a swindler. Like he, you know, <laughs> I have an accent when I go to Sri Lanka and talk, I'm not a Nate, you know, I'm an immigrant. So I sound like one. So of course they'll see you coming mm. down the street with your funny clothes and your funny way of talking. And he really tried to like, you know, um, <laughs> stick it to you. Really tried to ask me for a ton of money. I was like, "Listen, buddy, okay, I'll do what I can for you here." But uh, but it was really nice to work with them, and it ended up being like super uh, eye opening for me. Yeah. This way, this because I I had done one. I actually did the V wing starfighter yeah. from Star Wars in Patel Brown Gallery. Yes. That I did it on my own using strips of birch, but it was That very was the white one or the one that White one, yeah. super rectilinear, yeah. like it did really look like that. So for him to divert in this way, I was kind of like very inspired by that mm. and I didn't want to control it so, so much. And then we did, the paper is a marble paper yes. that is made by a woman who marbles paper in Colombo and only supplies them to grocery stores. You cannot order custom from her. She's too busy making her marble paper for the grocery store. You can only buy it in grocery stores. So, so if we you're were, buying you like better a believe fruit. we were running to supermarkets the whole time. It's like, oh, we're running out. We got to go to Kiehl's. Somebody's got to go to Kiehl's now. Yeah. So weird. That's the place you buy the marble paper. So we did the, um, we covered the, the shape that Chum in the made, yeah. and then it's lit from within by an LED strips that I just kind of like glue to the inside of the wood. But even right. that marbled paper would be used to wrap produce at the grocery store. No, it's a, it's like a craft paper, like gift wrapping. You would use oh, it I as see. a gift okay. wrap. 
You would That's use it. It's a wonderful thing. For, I think, books. Some people used it for books, yeah. like the inside of books. Inside of books, yeah. If they made books themselves, you know, they'll use it in the books, but only in the grocery store. So, you couldn't even talk to this woman. So popular, <laughs> so cool, you know, very busy lady. So you went, this piece ended up in Dubai? This has, th so this is at the Rio Theater, which is a porn theater in Colombo, and they, it's kind of like half of it is like squatters. So the yeah. Biennale, the Colombo Scope Biennale, like went right in through that all the way to the top floor of this theater building. It was actually really, really cool. I encourage all of you to try to go to Colombo Scope next edition. It's awesome festival. Mm -hmm. And then, but it was purchased, this piece was purchased by Warehouse 421, which I think is an artist run space in, du in Abu Dhabi. In Abu Dhabi, okay. So it, we had to ship this thing and take it back apart. I had left the country by then, but yeah, I think they had a, quite a time putting it back together without me or Jamin there. <laughs> oh, I don't know how they did that, but no, they it did. It looks good. I'm like, okay. Fantastic. Cool. So the last two slides, just before we open to the group here, is the two works that we saw just a few weeks ago at the Toronto International Art Fair, two small works that are you'll yeah. see are included uh, on the wall, flanking either side of the triptych commission for McMichael on the, on the far wall there in the gallery. And just, you know, exemplary, we started with a, a picture of your hand. Um, you know, do take the time to go and be with you know, these beautiful little works. They are tour de force like of them. texture. These, are just, these are sketches for larger works, these yeah. studies. Yeah. They're just be so delightful. So Thanks. I wanted to have this up, you know, while we're taking uh, thoughts and questions from the audience just to enjoy it while we're, while we're talking with you all. Hi, I'm just curious, did you ever finish your program at OCAD, or did you stop going to school? That's a great question. Great. Um, <laughs> Thank so you. I, let, I had a, a, quite a hard time at OCAD um, at the time that I was there. It was an extremely heavily colonized, like colonizing curriculum. So it's oppressive. It was oppressive. Um, I lasted about two and a half, three years straight, um, feeling very kind of sad and deflated by the end of that three years. And then I left school. I took a break. I was like, you know what? It's not working for me. I'm going to just leave for a sec. So for almost a year, I managed a surf lodge on the Pacific coast of Nicaragua called Surfing Turtle Lodge. And I didn't paint for a very long time because it was busy to manage that. Um, and, you know, on the trees there around, and these trees around the, the lodge, which is on an island called Isla Los Brasiles. Brasiles are mangrove trees. They grow these growths, these fruits that are, if you can't eat it, there's seeds inside, but it's like wood and they're stunning. They're about this big, right? So I took, I did take paints with me. So yeah. I take my paints out and I'm looking at these beautiful little things. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna start painting again. Start painting on them. And I started to like, readdress this visual language in a funny way. So I have these little cohotes around the world because it was international travelers coming through and they wanted to buy them. And I was, I was painting them with little snakes and little things and women and people doing things. So there's these little things all around the world that I was painting there on my break. And then, you know, when I gathered the energy back up and, and I had a plan, energetically speaking, to deal with an oppressive curriculum in a school, I came up with the sort of, I, I decided I'm gonna go back to school and do my best to change it because this is a art school in an immigrant city. There's no excuse for keeping the curriculum that way. So I went back to school kind of, I was glad I took a break because I was able to go back full of fire to, to stand up for what was my right. You need, I needed it. So I did the needful, I left, I came back and I finished school very well. <laughs> Being at art school for me, and this is as I travel now and I teach at art schools around Canada, I always try to say, you know, and you know, these school, these BFA programs, MFA programs replete with people who felt just like I did. Yeah. Like, what the hell is this, man? I'm paying top dollar to be here. There's nothing here for me. And, uh, and I always say, you know, this is about, art school is about community, meeting the people that are going to inspire you and be around you later on. 
um, as you have an art practice. You need yeah. a team. You always need a good team, whether you're an artist working alone in a studio or not. You do need a good team around you. So I insist about that part of art school being beneficial to me. I, I am glad that I moved downtown and moved out of Scarborough to, to be in that at that time. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of, you know, disagreements, uh, problems with professors, uh, complaints in the dean's office. There was a lot of that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's really helpful. You need that appropriate. It is helpful. You know what? That's, that's really good you say that because that's the other thing I try to say as I teach. I'm just like, you guys cannot be passive out here mm -hmm. lamenting a curriculum. You actually do. I know it's a lot of extra labor. No one's paying you for this, but... It's kind of the job of a student population to change the curriculum as well. You have to stand up and fight for what the people who are running the institution will not have the foresight to see. You are the one with the foresight. Yeah. You have to go to the front and say, hey, this curriculum does not reflect the student population of the school. It doesn't reflect the type of culture that we're about to make that we're on the cusp of. Here's what you need to do to change it. A lot of cases, people who are in the tenure track position they're very comfy. They don't want to do anything. It's, they're tired also. Congratulations. Yeah, Thanks. Exactly. Exactly. Other questions and thoughts? There's a hand, a couple of hands back here. I see elements of surrealism in your work, but I haven't heard you address that. Elements of surrealism. Yeah, particularly the, the, the hybrid uh, pieces earlier. The hybrid but, pieces. But kind of morph, you know, morph, morphing of faces. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and when you mutations. say surrealism, are you tying that to the sort of the great tradition of surrealist painters, like oil surrealist painters yes. from Europe? Nah, not necessarily from there, maybe. But yes, you can apply that term to, to those works. Um, and yeah, I really, you know what? I would actually put it closer to psychedelia and psychedelic mm -hmm. work. So mm -hmm. altered states, altered bodies, um, the metaphysics of the human body, energetically speaking. But when I speak about it that way, it also makes me think about sociology, mm -hmm. physiology, all of these other things. So it might be closer to psychedelia than it is mm -hmm. to surrealism. Hope that answers. Mm -hmm. For me personally, that's but in, I, yeah, I mean, what's interesting about your question is that surrealism, of course, drew deeply on indigenous culture. So you may oh, be right. seeing a likeness, mm -hmm. but the likeness, the, the flow of influence is actually going the opposite way. Right. Yeah. That's a nice way to put it. Hi, Rajni. Hi. Uh, I really found your talk fascinating and inspiring. Um, I'm a high school art teacher in Toronto. Um, it's, and thank you for being so honest and sharing with us your experience at OCAD. Um, I like to think that there's good progress being made in curriculum in Ontario in art education. Um, I would, and asking the students to, to make art that represents themselves, mm -hmm. giving them a voice is very, is critical. And um, I will definitely share your work with my students. Mm, great. Um, Thanks. But, yeah, and it would, I don't I know. I can come in and talk too, if time allows. We you would love to have to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, awesome, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Are there Is other questions? Up front here? Oh, we have one up here. Oh, it's me? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Rajni. Hi. I, I, I love your artwork, and uh, it's very inspiring. Thank you. And you started your, your talk uh, about the, the brown and black bodies being objectified and being used mm. in a certain way. And, and I was thinking about yourself in an art world that is dominated by a certain hegemony. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be always like a certain thing that people would like you to say, or, you know, that you are in a room and you represent something. Uh huh. Okay. I just wanted to know. Is it the pressure? You, are you talking about the pressure of identity performance? Yes, maybe. Well, yes. Oh, I love to talk about this. Yes, Excellent. and I would love to hear about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a huge. It's becoming a problem, right? Like that's mm -hmm. it's starting to become something that should be beautiful and free is becoming yucky and 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 pressurized and and expected in a certain way only. Mm -hmm. 
right? So when I was at school, starting, I, it's so funny, when I was at school, I was, start, I was seeing the opposite thing of students of color making white work. So work that looks like white artists' work. Still trying to address these issues of identity, of course, as artists have no, I mean, there's no, I don't know why there's so much pressure to make identity-based work, and I myself, I'm starting to definitely go away from it, but like this white delivery that mirrored sort of European and American mm -hmm. artists so that they would get better grades in school, which is the same thing in institute. You're more recognized if you have white Caucasian delivery of non-white subject matter mm -hmm. and you know non-white perspective. So it's just that's what I saw in school beginning, and now uh, institutions. Uh, it, that's something that's happening where, mm -hmm. you know, you're brought into like sing and dance, sing and dance without, without appreciation for, for your rigor as an artist, you know, just mm -hmm. brought in on the premise of identity performance alone. And as a result, I kind of, I'm sometimes seeing not great artwork in these mm -hmm. institutions at all. Just they're tokenizing artists of color and putting them in, they fill a ratio and fill a quota and that's it. Thank you very much. It's, you know, one out of the whatever 50 to 60 artists that they showed throughout the year between group shows and solo mm -hmm. or and then they're just, it's like done and dusted and it's finished and over with and it's just not good enough so so the performance the insistence on a performance of identity if you're an artist of color living in a colonized country it's generating some i hope that we can address these issues and and solve that Places like the McMichael are a great place where they're doing work to solve it and then working with artists who they feel have rigor artistically and, um, and go working from a place of love, from a place of love and like building, building the, that arts culture that, that we need actually, that, that us, these other institutions, they don't know how badly we need that. Mm -hmm. you know, well, it's, a, it's a need thing. And Needful. a place of, of trust. Trust, you know, love, compassion, the need to move beyond what's happening. There's, again, the comfort thing is coming up for me when you're high up enough and your institution is lauded and well-funded. There's that, there's sometimes there's comfort, mm -hmm. you know, in that old way that want to shake it up. It takes work to shake it up. Mm -hmm. You guys doing, not everybody wants to do this work, right? It's a lot well, of trust, work. You know, you have to ask goes. yourself, have you been doing, you know, what did I do, all that stuff. What have I done wrong in the past? But you're also, Rajni, open and, and trusting. You know, you, 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 you give the institution also the benefit of the doubt to meet you and, and hear yeah, you and I, see you. I do. And it works both ways. And we've been so honored to have your trust here at the McMichael. Yeah, this has been great. So this is a, you know, in regards to your question, this is a, has been a great remedy working here for that problem that's really starting to tick me off, to be honest. <laughs> but we'll solve it together. Yeah. We'll solve it, yeah. I They're think we this. have one more question in the back. Mm. Hi, Rajni, congratulations. It's so great to see this exhibition. This is maybe a question for both you and for Sarah. I'm so glad to hear that the institution has been incredibly supportive and you have a mutual relationship. I'm curious also, though, Sarah, to hear about uh, it's it's great to see this exhibition here. How how the McMichael is holding space for new artists in the country now called Canada, especially racialized artists, and how the inner workings of the institution reflect that. There was a recent Globe and Mail article this weekend about the lack of diversity in Canadian institutions. Mm -hmm. Does the staff reflect the publics it's serving? I mean, we're certainly moving, you know, moving in that direction. But of course, the McMichael has notoriously been a place of you know, in, in, in a sense, white supremacy, if you will, because it was built around the legacies of the Group of Seven, Tom Thompson, David Milne, Emily Carr, you know, the, the, the all-white canon of Canadian art. And, you know, one of the things that people don't know about the McMichael is that a third of our collection is Indigenous. Like, it's an extraordinarily important collection of Indigenous art, and we're just, um, Jen and I and, and she and a lot of the curatorial team here have been working hard on a, on a book that we will be putting out with our indigenous collection, which is gonna go on tour to three major American cities and then and back to Quebec City on the way home, but that will have over 70 essay cont contributions by indigenous writers, and the book is being uh, co-edited by Bonnie Devine, 
We're working, which you know, that will be the biggest book that McMichael has ever published. We're working on digitizing the Cape Dorset archive of original drawings. We're looking to hire someone for a two-year contract who's an Inuit scholar, mm -hmm. uh, an Inuk Inuit scholar, um, to work with that collection. And we will be um, hiring an indigenous curator into our team um, at the McMichael next year. But you know, we're making strides in our in our governance community is becoming more diverse. Uh, we understand that it's not just about the program, of course, at McMichael, you have to actually change the infrastructure as well. And so, you know, this is a very present and urgent issue in our in our governance community that we're working to address. But yeah. I mean, the, the proof is kind of, I think, in the pudding when we're able to make an experience for BIPOC people to come and work with us, whether it's the many um, indigenous artists that we are bringing into the collection and working with in our exhibitions. Um, we're just rolling over this, this um, uh, our main stage shows for Meryl McMaster and Dempsey Bob, who's an extraordinary Northwest Coast carver downstairs. So what's gonna be really exciting for us this, this winter is to have Rajni here with these amazing goddess figures moving into the future. And then in the galleries where Gathy Falk is now will be a career retrospective of Meryl, Meryl McMaster, who also works with the kind of you know, a ceremonial looking back at her cultural history and to walk through a show that's basically about indigenous displacement from land to a show of Rajni, which is about diasporic displacement in a way coming to North America to have those two shows resonate with each other. So we're, we're thinking about this question, which is a very, very good one on many, many levels. I'm glad to hear that it's... Uh, uh, McMichael. Oh, no. It's, it's nice to hear it in addition to programming on the structural side, and I'm just so glad to see this exhibition. And Oh, yeah. Well, so are, so are we. It's more. urgent. Yeah. It's urgent it's for been us. All, yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's been Thank awesome. you for the great and question. Just, yeah, that was more for you, but I just do want to say that for, you know, uh, diversifying the fact that in there... As they work to diversify urgently the staff here at McMichael, the culture is here to sustain those hires and to mm -hmm. like to like really really house that that whole um, that whole shift. It's it's here. It's, I think I feel like it's one thing for institutions to hire on BIPOC staff, but keeping them in right. an oppressive environment is like that's as big of a problem as the lack yes, of, of diversity. McMichael has the that culture of love here in a very specific way so whoever they work with and bring on and as it changes it that thing is that good nest the soft nest is here yeah I can say that from working with them that's but that's happening that. in a lot of institutions we probably should wrap up but across the country there are people that have been you know by BIPOC hires that have been made where people have been launched into the virtually all white staff and left yeah to fend for themselves and yeah. you know the most notorious example of that was uh, Charmaine Nelson's recent removal from, she decided to leave the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design where she had the Institute for Canadian Slavery and take her institute down south to the University of Massachusetts. She was, I mean, it was, you know, on the one hand, a bold and important move for NASCAD to house the Institute for Canadian Slavery, but then when they got her there, she really struggled to be heard and yeah. to be honored for her expertise and decided to go elsewhere. But the whole thing was a very traumatic and upsetting experience for her. So, mm. you know, we need we need that care. Yeah. And we need, you need to the learn culture. to listen. You need the yeah. culture in the institution yeah. to house like the birth of, of new things. Like you can't just like plop it in there. Yeah. So. And so we're learning that right now in this period in, in museums across the country. We have one more question, yeah. 